From years of anxiety to warrior and mentor, Bradley Robinson created the Anxiety Project to help you end your anxiety naturally. Let's mold the new you and let's end anxiety together. Hello and welcome to episode 150 of the Anxiety Project podcast. I am Brad Robinson, 150 episodes. You know, it doesn't feel that much to me. I know I'm just getting started, but I appreciate it. I just want to take this moment and appreciate you guys following along, leaving your comments, sharing your stories with me, and your suggestions as well as to what I should talk about. I really appreciate it. And I'm so lucky to be here after my anxiety disorder, free of anxiety, having more control over my life, and sharing with you guys these strategies, tools, techniques that worked for me. And then to hear from you guys how they're working for you gives me a lot of meaning in my life, provides me with a lot of meaning. And like I said before, I'm only getting started. Now, if you're suffering from anxiety, if you have trauma, if you have a lot of stress and chaos in your life, make sure you continuously follow along. Learn about anxiety. Learn what you can do to de-stress yourself. Learn about your anxiety response. The more you learn about your body, the more you can work with your body for its benefit. You can benefit the future you by sacrificing things now in the present moment, which I'll actually get into in this episode. But before I talk about guilt and how you can overcome guilt, I want to go over your comments on last week's episode about, what was it about? It was about one symptom leaves and then another comes and takes its place, which you guys found it to be really useful. Robin says, your episode came out at the perfect time. I am currently struggling with this issue of new symptoms appearing. The story of your cyst really clicked for me. This is a must re-listen episode for me. Thank you. Yeah, Robin, that cyst story amazes me. It absolutely amazes me that it happened that way. Going to the doctors and the doctor saying, oh, it's nothing, Brad, you know, it'll go away soon. If it persists for another five months, maybe come back. And her reaction towards it lessened my emotional grip over it, which I've obviously talked about in that episode. And it just, it just baffles me that that happened. Hunan says, when you said that Google is a portal for more uncertainty, I immediately stopped searching my symptoms. It made so much sense. Too many possibilities, beautifully put, Hunan. I like that you were used the word portal. That's, a, that's great. Oscar says, I love your Q&A episodes. I have a question. Where do I ask you? You can send me any questions on the YouTube video version of the podcast, or you can go to unpluganxiety.com where people usually go. And under contact, you can t take literally two minutes to, or however long you want to write out your question and then click send and it'll immediately come to my email. So you can do it that way. Now let's talk about guilt today. This is going to be really powerful. I say that to every episode. It's going to be really powerful. And that's because I try and stretch myself each and every episode because I want to provide you guys with the best information and the best strategies and tools and knowledge that I can. But this episode is going to be really good because guilt is a part of us. Uh, being a human being, we're going to uh, encounter guilt at some point. Now, good therapy on, on the internet as a great definition of guilt, they say guilt is feeling a feeling people typically have after doing something wrong, intentionally or accident, accidentally. 
a person's sense of guilt usually relates to their moral code. Now, people usually have the feeling or the voice that tells them not to do something before they do it. For me, it's usually that feeling. And I view it as the conscience, right? In Pinocchio, we see that Jiminy Cricket, which, you know, JC is Southern slang for Jesus Christ, by the way, which is really interesting. That's worth thinking about. So JC, Jiminy Cricket, serves as the conscience at the beginning, well, throughout the whole movie. But at the beginning of the movie, he serves as a tramp. And he's portrayed as a tramp, and that's really interesting. First of all, he's a bug, and it's like, what bugs you, right? It's that the feeling or the voice of something that bugs you. But also, he's a tramp, so he's been everywhere. He's been all around. And he spouts off words that don't make sense, which is really interesting. And... Because he's spouting off words that don't make sense or they, it, they sound very, they sound, it, it, he sounds like a mouthpiece. And so you can see because he sounds like a mouthpiece, he's a puppet as much as Pinocchio is, right? And so he's a tramp and he's also been everywhere. So he's a wanderer. And a wanderer means you have no set destination, no target. You, and you need a target. You need goals to provide meaning in your life. So the fact that he's a wanderer shows that there's no goals. There's too much chaos. There's too much uncertainty. There's too much, I guess, in that wandering state, you can say that there's too much impulsivity. So that's really interesting. So the conscious is a, this rough guy, and, and it shows that the conscience is in alignment with the state of Pinocchio. And at that beginning stage, Pinocchio, Pinocchio is a puppet. Pinocchio is a puppet of society. He's also a mouthpiece as well. So they're matching, right? The conscience and Pinocchio are matching at that point. But throughout the movie, as Pinocchio fails at things and he develops himself, you see the conscience. You see Jiminy Cricket develop as well. And then you see Jiminy Cricket's appearance start to improve. He buys, he, he's wearing better clothes, but also he starts to speak differently, more independent-like, which is interesting because as Pinocchio develops, his strings start to cut and he becomes a real boy. And so how does he become a real boy? He gets to the point where he's not automated but he's an indiv individual he's an he's thinking for himself and what's right for him and his moral code he has a strong moral foundation by the end of the movie right there's a stronger moral foundation it's not it's not he's not just a wandering compass right going everywhere he has a strong foundation and through those mistakes, Pinocchio, he better orients himself, right? Because that's what failure does. Failure is a teacher. It helps you orient yourself properly and helps you learn. He is aware of the mistakes and he learns from them. And that's the thing to being more self-conscious, right? Being aware of your mistakes helps you to not fall back into those mistakes again in the future. And then as you watch Pinocchio improve and become more independent, you see the cricket. He improves, in, like I said, in his speech and in, his, in what he wears and how he acts. And as Pinocchio ventures into the unknown and builds his character... His conscious does that as well It's at the same time. And it's through your awareness of the things that are not working for you 
that you can fix your orientation and where you're aiming. And for me, I ignored my conscience for a long time. My moral compass was everywhere because I was living up on Pleasure Island at the time. And you can view your conscience as that moral compass, the thing that's guiding you in the right direction, what's right and what's wrong. My orientation in the past was aimed at coping, dependency. In other words, remaining as a puppet to my family, my addictions, my impulses, and my emotions, not in control. So without any control, without any order, what did you think my mental health looked like? There's too much chaos. Everything, there's too much. My, I was walking around with my glass overflowing with too much baggage. And you see that today with people, people who are so overly reactive. You know, you talk to somebody and they get angry so quickly. And you don't want to be around them because you feel weighed down by their burdens when you are around them, right? There's just too much chaos and you unconsciously back away from those people. And well, at the time when I was living on Pleasure Island and a puppet to all these addictions and my emotions, well, I looked chaotic. I was running around aimlessly and quickly I mean I would leave my home and forget important things my wallet books for school you get the idea so the guilt those habits I was doing produced became suppressed over time and suppression is when you are consciously aware of the feelings and behaviors but you kind of ignore them. You're like, ah, that's painful, but I'm going to push them aside. And so those habits, the, the, the more I repeated those habits, like watching pornography or going out with my friends, smoking weed, eating junk foods, um, ignoring work and responsibilities, the more I repeated these habits, the more habitual and cemented they became within my unconscious mind. Also habits I want I really want to touch on that supported my anxiety were the coping strategies that I would do like reassurance seeking or googling symptoms or touching parts of my body or you know ignoring going to work because I was afraid of being outside of my safe zone I was going to have a panic attack or die or make a fool out, out of myself so my unconscious mind attached a lot of value to these habits because I was acting them out and what you act out determines what you value every single day and that's really really interesting so chaos is a vacuum right if you orient yourself towards chaos you're going to get sucked in to that chaos and believe me you easily get sucked into chaos if you're aiming in that direction. Also, the pleasure from these habits kept me stuck, right? The outcome of that feel-good dopamine kick. But then there was that crash as well that I really want to emphasize because during that crash was the guilty feelings. Like, oh, what am I doing? Those words that I would get. Right. I'd get the feeling, but then I'd also get those words like, oh, oh God. It'd usually be those brief words, right? Oh God. Ugh. Right. These habits were only leading me into a brick wall. And that's really interesting. And that's what happened when I started to overcome anxiety was I started to realize that the habits I was doing was only leading me down a dead end road. I wasn't feeling fulfilled. It wasn't rewarding. I felt empty inside. And to move past guilt, I had to show myself through my actions that I've learned 
not to do it again. I had to show myself that I can get beyond this, that I'm not dependent on these things. By attaching reasons around the habit to why it's no good, pain to the habits, right? But then you might ask me, well, Brad, how did you become aware of these habits if you were unconscious and living on Pleasure Island? How did how are you aware of these habits if they were so automated and, and, and a big part of your identity? Well, to answer that, I started to be more conscious, conscious of these guilty feelings when I started to adopt mentors, people who overcame the same challenges I was currently going through and have overcome them. So I stumbled upon people who talked about things like, well, I hope overcoming anxiety and what to do, but also things like nofap, right? Uh, abstaining from porn and masturbation, right? Uh, and those people interested me, interested me because they were thinking outside the box and I was in my own box for such a long time. And so these people kind of like sparked interest in me. Oh, they were doing this, this same thing, but they're not doing it anymore. That's interesting. I want to learn more about what they're doing. Are there benefits to sacrificing these habits? Do they get more out of not doing them? And so I eventually learned that, well, the answer is yes to things like nofap or to coping dependent strategies, anxiety sufferers engaging like Googling and reassurance uh, seeking, things like that. There are benefits to sacrificing those habits and you increase your independency when you do that. And when you are more independent, what that means is you're more mentally strong and you're more comfortable in your own skin. And so these mentors, they served as the ultimate judge for me and to you as well. They serve as that ultimate judge. And you see that in The Lion King, right? Because when you're watching your well, these successful people who overcame these challenges, what happens is your own insecurities bubble up to the surface. And you see that reflected in the Lion King when uh, Simba, I almost forgot his name for a moment. Simba was on Pleasure Island with Timon and Pumbaa, right? Acting like a child, doesn't want to grow up and go back to the kingdom and take on the responsibility because the tyrannical kingdom is now run by Scar and it's it's doomed and why face that doomed re, uh, reality when I can live on Pleasure Island and eat bugs all day and sit around in pools and not do anything. Not take on not take on any responsibility, but what's so fascinating about that is when Nala comes around, she's trying to slap him out of his childish ways, and Simba doesn't want like that right at first. He doesn't want to be slapped out of his ways or awaken to the, his in, inadequacies. But, and that's what happened to me too. When I was living on Pleasure Island, when I first met Maggie, she was so conscious and she wanted to eventually have a family and live a responsible and meaningful life. And I just wanted to play around on Pleasure Island and not take on any responsibility. But the more I was with her, the more I came into Con, like I was more, I came into contact, that's the word, of my inadequacies and in what I was doing because I was subjected to someone like her. If I am constantly subjected to unconscious people, I'm going to remain unconscious. And it's a blow. It's a blow to the gut when you're around those types of conscious people that are successful and properly oriented 
and it's a waste. It's a it's a blow to the gut because you realize that what you've been doing this whole time is a waste of time, right? And it, what you've been doing for five years, ten years, twenty years, it's been harming you, and it sucks. So you have to really ask yourself. And I want you to sit on the edge of your bed or in a quiet place in your car and really ask yourself, what things am I doing daily that I know I should stop doing but can't seem to? And you really, When you really ask yourself that question, your unconscious will bring up something and it's going to be painful. You're not going to like it, but it's a sign from the universe that you need to work on that particular thing. And I advise you to pick one thing. Don't overwhelm yourself with 10 things to work on. Pick one aim to work on. What do you need to work on? What addiction do you need to work on? What challenge do you need to work on? Pick that one thing that you know you're doing, that you're acting out every day to be wrong and you know to be wrong and believe in yourself that that's true, right? And I think it's true because it, when it comes from your unconscious mind, I think it's absolutely 100% true. The more you adjust yourself, you adjust your aim and you sacrifice the acts you do that don't serve that higher self, the more you prove to yourself that you are a good person and that those behaviors are behind you rather than with you right now. So I want to end this podcast with a powerful question. What's there to be guilty about if you've let go of all of those guilty behaviors? And that's where I'm going to leave you on today's podcast episode. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Remember, or if you don't know, my program is 15% off this season. If you use promo code coupon code and anxiety, you get 15% off the program. And lastly, do not let anxiety define who you are. I will see you on the next podcast or video. Bye for now. Brad's Powerful Anxiety Recovery Program is now available at unpluganxiety.com. The Anxiety Project program is downloadable and puts the power of anxiety recovery in your own hands. Visit unpluganxiety.com for more details. Recovery starts now.